you're joining us in a part of a series that we've been going through, one of my favorite subjects, which is dealing with the life of David. We're talking about the shepherd king, and today's presentation, we're going to be dealing with the subject of from Carmel to Ziklag. In our last story, we saw that David had a very interesting experience where um, he appealed to a local rancher they had been protecting if they could make a donation to help a little bit with uh, the costs of feeding an army. <laughs> and he basically reproved them. David was on his way to exact vengeance on Nabal, and uh, Abigail interceded. She appealed, brought uh, a, a gift, and uh, basically averted what could have been a terrible disaster. And then at the end of the story, David, uh, very amazed at uh, Abigail and the kind of woman she was, he learns that Nabal has a stroke and he dies. He proposes to Abigail, and she becomes his wife. So now, in the time between when David marries Abigail and this all happens, there's one more episode where David is surrounded by Saul. David sneaks into Saul's camp at the night. Abishai says, strike him to the ground with a spear. David says, no, he's the Lord's anointed. Forgive him. And um, again, David confronts Saul and says, see here, I'm not trying to kill you. I had a chance. Here's your spear. Here's your water jug. And, um, and Saul says, oh, I'm sorry. It was just an accident. I'll, you're going to prevail, David. And, and then at the end of that, David says, you know, how many times has Saul acted like he was going to change his mind, but he can't help himself? He tries to pin him against the wall with a spear, and then he tells Jonathan, I was just kidding, I really like him. And then he tries to pin him against the wall again with his spear. And then he sends soldiers after him, and David finds him in the cave, cuts off his robe. For Saul says, make a covenant with me. You're going to be king. I'm sorry. Then again, he goes into the camp. He does it again. Saul can't help himself. He is demon-possessed. He just is so controlled by vengeance. And so that brings us to our next section. Turn with me to 1 Samuel chapter 27, verse 1. Now I will perish someday by the hand of Saul. There is nothing better for me than that I should escape to the land of the Philistines. And Saul will despair of seeking me anymore in any of the parts of Israel, so I will escape out of his hand. Now, this is a low point for David. This is David who had escaped so many times because God had promised you're going to be king and I want you to fight against the Philistines. I want you to set Israel free. I, I want you to expand the territory of Israel. And David has lost faith. It's not a great verse, but you know, it's there to remind us that that happens to us. Just before that statement that David makes, I'm going to just go to the land of the Philistines. Listen to what David writes in Psalm 121. I'll lift up my eyes to the hills from whence comes my help. My help comes from the Lord who made the heaven and the earth. He will not allow your foot to be moved. He will not, he who does not slumber, he will not, um, he shall neither slumber or sleep who keeps Israel. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun will not strike you by day nor the moon by night. The Lord shall preserve you from all evil. He will preserve your soul. The Lord shall preserve your going in and your coming out from this time forth even forevermore. Well, that's, that's great. He should have read that psalm. <laughs> God will keep you. God will preserve you. God will not forsake you. Now, the reason I think this is important for us to consider because you have all sung songs before that have wonderful statements of faith, but you don't live them out. I have too. But since I'm looking at you, I'm going to talk about you. <laughs> we, you know what I'm talking about? We read these statements, we say these prayers, we, say, we talk about the victories and things that God has done for us, and you know what? In listening to the devil for five minutes, you can forget a lifetime of God delivering you. Just look at the children of Israel. When they're in Egypt, God miraculously feeds them with bread from heaven. He delivers them from the Amalekites that attack them. He gives them water out of a rock. He sends plague after plague on their enemy. He parts the sea for them, pillar of fire to keep them from being in the dark. He does all of this, and after doing all of this, you know what they say? First time tough, something gets rough, they said, 
Oh, the Lord brought us out here so we could perish in the wilderness. Let's just go back to Egypt. We'll go back to our enemies, the land of the enemy. You know, I sort of probably misnamed this message. I should have called it the land of the enemy because uh, the whole thing takes place in the land of the enemy. Sometimes God's people try to serve the Lord in the land of the enemy. And so you know what David does. I'm going to go back to uh, 1 Samuel 27. David arose and he went over with 600 men who were with him to Achish, the son of Maok, the king of Gath. Now have you heard the word Gath before? This is the second time David goes to Gath. Remember Goliath was of what? David is going to the hometown of his chief adversary that he's killed. Now he did this once before, but when he went before he ran there by himself. And even Achish said, what is this? Isn't this David that they sang, you know, Saul has killed his thousands, but David is ten thousands. That would be ten thousand Philistines, and he's here? And that's when David pretended he was crazy. That's back in Achish. Now he's back in Achish again. Except Achish now welcomes him because David, he realized David kind of fooled him before. David's been running around the hills with a small army. And David, they've learned that Saul keeps trying to kill David. There's a civil war in the country, and you know that old expression, my enemy's enemy is my friend. And since Achish was enemies with Saul, and Saul was enemies with David, David said, well, if I'm not going to be able to live in Israel where Saul is, he won't give up hunting me. I'll just go stay where Achish is. And Achish says, aha, I have just strengthened my army by 600 men. Not only 600 men, the chief crack forces of Israel. You know, different armies have got their uh, green berets or their navy seals or their army rangers. David was the elite force of Israel. He was, at one time he was Saul's armor bearer. Then he became a captain and every time, David never lost a battle. You read about it. And now that elite force of David has just come to Achish and he's going, all right. It flatters him and they bring their families. They are now going to be on my side. I bet we can overcome Israel at this point. Achish receives him. And so for a few days, David and his 600 men and all their families, they're down there with Achish. But you know, David noticed something. And you read a little later in the Bible, you find out Goliath had a family. David's walking around Gath with Goliath's sword. Painful reminder <laughs> that David had beheaded the champion of the town. You read later in the Bible, you find that Goliath has a brother and he's got maybe two brothers and two sons. Uh, the Hebrew's not clear, but he had some relatives that were big. There's another guy in Gath who was um, a brother of Goliath. He's got 24 fingers and toes. Six on each hand. And you know, that is, I've seen that myself. Um, it's um, not that uncommon, especially if there's any incest. How many of you have seen a cat with like seven toes? It usually comes from inbreeding with the cats. And the theory is that the people in Gath saw how big Goliath was, that they were trying to inbreed the family a little bit to get an army of Goliaths. And one of them came out with 24 toes. He later is killed by David's brother. Chimia. But they were alive at this point in Gath. So you got Goliath's relatives walking around town. And they're looking at Goliath and King Achish says, you know, I'm so glad you've come to join me. Finally, David says to the king, uh, verse 5, if it pleases you, uh, maybe you could give me another place to stay in your territory. Somewhere to dwell. It's not fair that I should be staying in one of the royal cities with the king. I'm not worthy. But really, David realized it was causing a little bit of anguish. And the other thing was, they worship Dagon. They worship other gods in Gath. And um, David wanted to be in a position where he was a little further out of the capital where he could uh, worship Jehovah because it was going to be a conflict. Now, the Philistines had five major cities. They had Ashdod, Ashkelon, Gaza, Ekron, and Gath. The Philistines did not have one king. They were divided up in a little more kind of a Greco-Roman style where they had five kings and they were representative kings and these were the five principal cities. There was a king of Ashdod, Ashkelon, Gaza, Ekron, Gath. And so um, 
Gath was a little further south of Judea. It uh, was closer to the border of Judea and the land of the Amalekites and the Arabs in the desert regions. So Achish says, I'll tell you what, I'll give you a Ziklag. And you can stay in Ziklag. Now Ziklag means winding. And while David is living in the land of the enemy, he is on a winding road. And Ziklag was a fortress city down on the borders of the Philistine territory, bordering Judah and bordering the, um, well, the country of the Arabs, really, that lived down there. Therefore, from that time to this time, it says Ziklag has belonged to the kings of Judah. Now, the time that David dwelt in the country of the Philistines was one year and four months. And he acted like he was friends. But you know what's really going on? It says, David and his men, I'm um, in verse 8, David and his men raided the Gersherites and the Gerzites and the Amalekites, for those nations were the inhabitants of the nations from old, as you go to Mount Shur, even as far as the land of Egypt. So David, he's got to feed an army. And so what he does is his, they pretty much have filled up the city of Ziklag. He and his soldiers, they go on raids. It's very common. You remember the story of Naaman? That's how Naaman and his family got the little girl. They went on a raid in the northern country of Israel. And they would kill, they'd seize the livestock. They'd kill anyone who resisted. They'd take away the women and children as slaves. And, and um, they're always raiding each other's borders. You remember the story of Elisha when they're burying Elisha. It's an interesting story. Um, they're going out to conduct the funeral and they haven't quite lowered the body down in the grave yet. And all of a sudden they see Moabite raiders are coming into the country and they say, what do we do? We've got to bury this man. It wasn't Elisha there. They had to bury a man. And they saw that Elisha's grave was there and so they opened up the lid off Elisha's grave. They tossed him in and he came back to life when he touched the bones of Elisha. You remember that story? But it was the raiders were coming. They're always raiding each other's borders. You lived in Israel back in one of those days. You didn't want to live on the edge. <laughs> it wasn't safe on the edge. You wanted to be right in the middle. So David went out raiding because he had to feed his army. And he's raiding the enemies that Joshua and the children of Israel had not subdued when they were supposed to when they came into the land. You remember King Saul was told, go wipe out the Amalekites but he didn't completely do it. So David says, well, I'll do it. So he attacks the Amalekites and the Gershrites and these other countries that had been enemies of Israel and they were allies of the Philistines. But when he does this, he then brings gifts to Achish. He says, here's some livestock. And, but he doesn't bring any people because he's telling Achish, he'd say to him, where'd you go raiding today? He said, oh, well, I was raiding Judah. I was raiding my, the Jews, the Israelites. I went to Judah and against the southern area to the Jarshamalites and against the southern area and the Kenites. They were related to Israel. Some of you remember a girl named Jael who killed Sisera. She was a Kenite. They lived down in that country. And David would save neither man nor woman alive. Now this is tough to believe, but David and his men, they wouldn't leave any witnesses. But they were attacking the ancient enemies that God had told Israel to wipe out, but he's being very duplicitous. He said, oh yeah, Lord, I'm serving you in the land of the enemy, and I'm lying the whole time. I'm pretending that I'm friends with the enemy while I'm serving you. He was being a secret Israelite. We got some secret Christians out there. Any secret Christians out there? You come to church, you know you're a Christian, you want to fight for the Lord, but no one else out there knows. You're living in the land of the enemy, but in your heart you're a secret Christian. <laughs> Someone once said that there's no such thing as a secret Christian because either your Christianity will destroy the secret or your secrecy will destroy your Christianity. But if you try to live a Christian life in the land of the enemy for very long, something's going to compromise. And David had to lie all the time. And he'd bring these, some of the spoils he'd take from these other towns. He'd keep most of it for his army. He'd bring some as gifts to Achish, kind of a tax. And he'd say, wow, boy, you're being pretty brutal fighting your own people. You don't even leave any survivors. Because often you take survivors as slaves. But he said, ah, oh, I'm not keeping anyone alive. Well, he was attacking the Philistines' um, friends. And so this goes on for a year and four months, and nobody catches on. And uh, he'd save neither man or woman alive. So Achish believed David. 
saying, He's made the people of Israel utterly arbor him. Therefore he'll be my servant forever. Now something I think is interesting that when David makes up his mind that he's going to go stay in the land of the Philistines, you know so many other times David, uh, he's got a priest with him and he will say to Abimelech, bring me the, uh, the ephod, let's inquire of the Lord. But David never inquires of the Lord about going to stay in the land of the Philistines. Something else, as well as the scholars can tell, David never writes a song while he's down there. Uh, he sort of is living in no man's land in the experience. He's wandering. He kind of made the mistake that the Israelites made saying, uh, I want to go back to Egypt. So it happens during this time that he's living down there in Ziklag that the Philistines gather their armies together for war to fight against Israel. Now why do you think they choose to do that? Because the strongest fighting force in Israel is now on their side. They believe the battle is going to turn. Saul has spent so much time and money chasing around his own country, fighting his own people. He killed his priests. He's fighting after David. They have become weakened during this time when they should have been building up the army. They've been distracted. And the Philistines realize that they are now vulnerable. And so they amass, probably in the spring of the year, for a great apocalyptic war. It's not a skirmish. This is an all out, all hands on deck war where they're calling all of the armies of Israel. Sometimes they went out to battle. You read Saul took 3,000 men. But this is not that battle. This is where every man is called. And the Philistines get all the five kings together and all of them get all of their armies together and they are doing a full out war with Israel. And it says here that uh, they gathered for war on chapter 28 of 1 Samuel and Achish the king of Gath says to David, you'll surely know that you can go out with me to battle, you and your men. You're going to join us, aren't you? And David said, man, what am I going to do? How am I going to go fight against my own people? God said, I'm supposed to be the king of these people. I'm supposed to kill them? How? I can't do that. But here he's been lying to Achish, so what do you say? And so he kind of gives a veiled answer. He says, you know what your servant can do. What does that mean? And Achish said, and then I'll make you one of my chief guardians forever. You'll be my number two man. How sad. David, who is supposed to be the king, he is now standing shoulder to shoulder with the Philistines that worship fish gods. And that really was that. You know, this kind of hurt him for years after that, that the people always knew you compromised. God had delivered you so many times before and you forgot about all those times God protected and delivered you and you forgot, you lost faith that he would keep delivering you and you compromised right before you were anointed king with the enemy. And you made friends with the enemy. Gath of all things the king of Goliath. And so, you know, he said, yeah, yeah, sure, whatever you say, your majesty. Now, it goes on to say in verse 3, Samuel had died. It mentions that also in chapter 25, but it's reminding us what we're about to get into. Samuel had died, and all Israel had lamented for him and buried him in Ramah in his own city. And Samuel had put the mediums and the spiritists out of the land. And the Philistines gathered together and they came and encamped in Shunem. So Saul gathered all of Israel together and they encamped in Gilboa. You all remember where Shunem is. That's where the prophet Elisha used to stay with that uh, great woman of Shunem and her family. And when Saul saw the army of the Philistines, he was afraid and his heart trembled greatly. And this is a man who had once been anointed by God, filled with the Spirit of God, had the courage of God. It didn't matter how many soldiers there were, but he's now separated himself from God. He's grieved away the Holy Spirit. And Sa Saul inquired of the Lord, and the Lord did not answer him. Well, he'd killed all the priests. How do you inquire of the Lord then? neither by Urim or by the prophets. You know, this is when you get to the place where you don't hear the voice of the Lord anymore. You wondered what the unpardonable sin is like. That doesn't mean that sometimes we all go through spells where it seems like God is quiet. That doesn't mean you've grieved away the Holy Spirit. Don't misunderstand. But he, he received no answer because he had refused to listen and now he's in a crisis. 
And finally, in desperation to show, this was a time of testing. And Saul failed the last test. Then Saul said to his servants, Find me a woman who is a medium, that I might go to her and inquire of her. Now he wouldn't have specified a woman because they had male mediums too. He, had, he knew there was one in the area. And the servants said to him, In fact, there is a woman who is a medium, an Endor. Now what does God's word say about inquiring of mediums? It tells us, don't do it. You shall not permit a sorceress to live. Is that clear? <laughs> Leviticus 20 verse 6, and the person who turns the mediums and familiar spirits to prostitute himself with them, I will set my face against that person and cut him off from his people. See what the prognosis is when we start getting into spiritualism? First Chronicles 10 13, why was Saul judged? So Saul died for his unfaithfulness which he had committed against the Lord because he did not keep the word of the Lord and also because he consulted a medium for guidance. Does God want us going to the spiritualists of the world to find out what we're supposed to do? So they find this woman and some of the servants of Saul disguise themselves and Saul disguises himself as king. They go in and the woman said, what can I do for you? And they said, look, we want you to uh, call up Samuel the prophet. She said, oh, you're testing me. Saul's cut off all the spiritualists of land. They said, you don't have anything to worry about. And then finally she realizes, this is Saul. Why did you deceive me? You are Saul. King said, don't be afraid. Call up this prophet. Bring up Samuel for me. He said, I need to know what to do. And so this apparition appears. She goes through her incantations and she throws a little gunpowder on the fire or something and you know, they, they dance around and they've got the vapor and smoke and they make the woo-woo noises and, and uh, when I was a kid our family was, we were into spiritualism and we had Ouija boards and us, my mom wrote astrology songs and it just, it is so much garbage but you know there's a real dark power involved in all of that and uh, you know, when you try and talk to the dead, you're really speaking to devils. One of the last great deceptions that's going to come on the world, it says that three unclean spirits like frogs, Revelation 16, come out of the mouth of the beast, the dragon, and the false prophet, and they go forth to the kings of the earth to deceive them. And I, these, I think there's going to be devils that will impersonate the dead that are going to start manipulating leaders of the world who've gotten involved in spiritualism in the last days because they don't know the dead are dead. And this is exactly what happened to King Saul is going to happen to people in the last days. This happens before great judgment on God's people. It's going to happen in the end also. So this devil that is coming pretending to be Saul, and some say, no, she, it really was Samuel. No, it's not Samuel. Does, uh, does a witch have the power to resurrect a prophet of God? And also the message that is given is a totally hopeless message. And it says, you're going to die tomorrow, and your sons are going to die. And finally, when Saul hears this, he just falls flat out on the ground. He is so overcome with fear. He hadn't eaten anything that day. Verse 20, and Saul fell full length on the ground and was dreadfully afraid because of the words of Samuel. And there was no more strength in him. He had eaten nothing all that day and all night. And the woman came to Saul, and Saul, he was severely troubled. She said, look, I listened to your voice. I put my life in my hands and I did a, a seance for you is what it amounts to. And now you have to listen to me. Let me feed you something. So she goes and kills a fatted calf. It's very different from the fatted calf that Abraham kills for the Lord. And uh, boy, they must have been fast back in those days. The prodigal son comes home. They have a feast right away. Kill the fatted calf. I mean, they, they knew how to clean a calf and cook it and make bread in no time. It always amazed me. Now she does this because Saul's there and he's got his entourage, he's got his guard and his servants, so she's not only got to feed him, she's got to feed all of them. But how sad, where's David? He should have been ready to walk in and fight in that battle and been victorious and maybe Saul would have died and David would have been proclaimed king but at least fighting on the right side. David is in the land of the enemy and because David's in the land of the enemy, now Saul is in the land of the enemy and he's talking to a witch. 
it's not a very bright chapter. You know, when you read the last few uh, chapters here in 1 Samuel, God's leaders are hanging out with the enemy. And so finally, she feeds Saul and he and his servants leave. And go to chapter 29. Then the Philistines gather together and all their armies at Aphek. And the Israelites encamp by a fountain which is in Jezreel. By the way, there's a valley there by Jezreel called Megiddo. And so when you read in the Bible about the battle of Armageddon, there are many great battles that took place in the valley of Jezreel, which is Megiddo. Same area. The battle of Gideon was in Megiddo, the valley of Jezreel. The valley that um, in the days of Deborah was here in the valley of uh, Megiddo, means hill of Megiddo, it's above the valley of Jezreel. This is another pivotal battle that takes place there. And the lords of the Philistines passed in review by hundreds. They get all their armies together, and here we are from Ascalon, here we are from Ekron, here we are from Gath, and they all, big parade, and they're all with their pomp and their ceremony, and then trailing the troops of Gath, the other kings of the Philistines see six or seven hundred Hebrews. And they're going, what? We're getting ready to go fight the Hebrews. What are they doing? Here. Can you understand their dismay? And the army's actually grown. Something I left out I need to tell you. Why David is a Ziklag? Listen to what you read in 1 Chronicles 12. Soldiers begin to come to David. They see that Saul has lost courage. They see that Saul is, he's raving. I mean, before when he had his episodes, David would play the harp, but the musician's gone now. And so, um, they're losing confidence in their king. You read in 1 Chronicles 12, verse 1, Now these were the men who came to David at Ziklag, while he was still a fugitive from Saul, the son of Kish. And they were among the mighty men, the helpers in the war, armed with bows, using both the right hand and the left hand, and hurling stones. That's good. Man, I can, can't throw a rock with my left hand. They were of Benjamin. It says they could, they could hurl stones at a hair's breadth and not miss and they could fire arrows with the bow. They were talented. And they were of Benjamin, Saul's brethren. So now they're not just coming from Judah. The people of Benjamin, his own family, are losing faith. Read in 1 Chronicles, same chapter. Go to verse 20. 1 Chronicles 12, 20. When he went to Ziklag, those of Manasseh defected to him, were Adna and Jezebad and Jadiel and Michael and another Jezebad and Elihu and Zelitha, captains of thousands who were from Manasseh. And they helped David against the bands of raiders, for they were all mighty men of valor, and they were captains in the army. For in that time they came to David day by day to help him until his army was a great army like the army of God. So before he finally goes to Ziklag, or from Ziklag to go to the battle in Jezreel, it's not just 600 men. His army is swelling because they're all coming to him because he's got his own kingdom now, his little fortress, his own city of Ziklag. And so all of a sudden the Philistines, they see that uh, the, the parade, all these soldiers are in review before they go into battle, and all of a sudden there's a whole contingent of hundreds and maybe over a thousand now of soldiers come with David leading them, and they look at Achish and they go, what's with this? What are these Hebrews doing here? And, and now David, of all things, David talk about being low, he even gets rejected by the Philistines. But the princes of the Philistines, I'm in 1 Samuel 29, 4, the princes of the Philistines were angry with him. So the princes of the Philistines said to him, make this fellow return that he goes back to the place where you've appointed for him. They basically said to Achish, are you crazy? We're going to go into battle. What better way for him to make peace with Saul than in the middle of a battle to turn on us? because that had actually happened, if you read your Bible, in the battle of Michmash. It tells us that the Hebrews that were slaves to the Philistines that went into battle against Israel, they turned on the Philistines in that battle, and they said, this is going to happen again. They're going to turn on us. And so Achish goes, he says, look, David, I'm sorry. He says, I trust you. Matter of fact, you can read verse 29, uh, verse 6 of chapter 29. Achish calls David and says, surely as the Lord lives, you've been upright in your going out and your coming in. David must have hung his head then. Oh, yeah. He'd been out, you know, f lying every day. You've been upright and you're going out and you're coming in. And everything you've done has been good in my sight. For this day, I've not found any evil in you, 
from the day you came to me. Nevertheless, the lords of the Philistines, they don't favor you. So you better go back home. It's really hard to fight the enemy when you're with the enemy. <laughs> and uh, some of us have wondered, you know, I, I think you need to make your colors clear if you're a Christian. It saves you lots of trouble. You notice that when Jesus was being crucified, but when he was being tried, Peter followed Jesus from a distance. John went into the judgment hall with Jesus. Peter, trying to look like he wasn't too closely connected with Jesus, he hung out with the enemies of Jesus. Peter ends up denying Jesus. John walked right on in, stood by Jesus. He did not deny him. If we follow Jesus from a distance like that, and we hang out in the land of the en enemy, we're going to end up denying Christ. I let people know right up front, I'm a Christian. I mean, it just makes all the boundaries really clear. Saves all kinds of problems. So now David and his soldiers, they're rejected. They're also really worried what's going to happen to Israel, but they are sent on their way, and my guess is that the Philistines, they send a little uh, contingent of scouts. They said, follow them, make sure they go back that they don't turn around. And so they're sent on their way. They've got to head back now. Ninety miles they've marched from Ziklag up to Jezreel. That's a long ride. They've only been there a day or two. Now they've got to turn around. They've got to come all the way back again. I want you to know that because they're really tired and they have to go into another battle. When David and his men came back to Ziklag on the third day, it took them three days to get back. You know how many times things happen on the third day? that the Amalekites had invaded the south and Ziklag and attacked Ziklag and burned it with fire. They had attacked the southern extremities of Judah and the border of the Philistines. Now why would they do such a terrible thing? Well David had been attacking them. Did you just read that? You know something about uh, the history of the Amalekites and the Israelites? It, it's important to understand it is one of the longest standing feuds and they had the most brutal command um, the Amalekites were an age-old enemy of Israel. Exodus 17, 14. The Lord said to Moses, Write this for a memorial in the book and recount it in the hearing of Joshua that I will utterly blot out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. Why? The first person who attacked Israel as a nation, when they became a nation they came out of Egypt, the Amalekites attacked them, but they didn't just attack them. It was totally unprovoked. They hadn't done anything to them, and they attacked the sick and the weak that were straggling in the back. Look in Deuteronomy 25, 17. Remember what Amalek did to you on the way as you were coming out of Egypt, how he met you on the way and attacked your rear ranks, all the stragglers at your rear when you were tired and weary and they did not fear God. It was, it was a, a, a despicable thing. You remember the story where Moses stands on the mountain, he stretches out his arms and he intercedes. This is that battle with Amalek. Moses is told to declare that you will never forget what the nation of Amalek did. The battle between Israel and Amalek goes all the way through until you get to Haman, who is a descendant of Amalek, and Mordecai in the book of Esther. So it is a long-standing, underlying feud between these two. So now the Amalekites attack David and Ziklag while he's gone, and they carry them all away captive. And they took captive the women and those who were with them from small to great. They did not kill anyone but they carried them away undoubtedly to sell them to the Egyptians or something. So David and his men came to the city and it was burned with fire and their wives and their sons and their daughters had been taken captive and David and the people who were with him they lifted up their voices and they wept until they had no more power to weep. And David's two wives Ahinoam the Jezreelitess and Abigail the wife of Nabal the Carmelite had been taken captive and David was greatly distressed for the people spoke of stoning him this is one of the times, you know, some of God's leaders that are types of Christ, they talked about stoning Moses, they talked about stoning Elijah, and they wanted to stone David. They talked of stoning him, and you can kind of understand. I said, David, here's your bright idea. We were much safer living in the caves of En Gedi, and here you've got us now living with the Philistines, and look, we're gone, to, we marched off under this pretense of fighting with the Philistines, and while we were gone, we've lost everything. 
And so you can see you lose your family, you start getting mad, and they're ready to kill David, who they had loved. They were ready to die for him before. And so suddenly it's almost like a light clicks on in David's mind. He had been trying to do things in his own strength. He says, I, I'm going to have to go to the Philistines because that's how I'll save myself. Saul will stop siege. He never inquires of the Lord. He's trying, and here I'll attack these regions and I'll raid these countries and I'll give a little bit to Gath and I'll lie to them and I'll say I went, and he's, got, he's trying to save himself. All of a sudden the light comes on. At the end of verse 6, it says, David strengthened himself in the Lord his God. You know, we all need friends that can strengthen us. But sometimes when your friends are ready to stone you, all you can do is strengthen yourself. And David realized, how did we get here? And he, and he thought, you know, God, you're the only one I've got left to turn to. Now even my soldiers are ready to kill me. And suddenly David says, that's right, don't we have a priest here among us? That's, and he calls for Abiathar, the, the priest, Ahimelech's son. He says, please bring the ephod to me. And Abiathar brought the ephod. And now David is inquiring of the Lord again. Praise the Lord. He's turning back to God. He says, shall I pursue this troop, this army of raiders? It's bigger than just a group of raiders, you'll see. That att attack Ziklag, will I overtake them? And he says, pursue. You will surely overtake them and without fail recover all. That's quite a promise. So David he goes and 600 men who were with him and he comes to the brook Besor. You look at your map, you'll find that he's gone way down south towards Egypt. There's a creek that actually has water most of the year where they stay, where some were left behind. But David, he and 400 men pursued and 200 stayed behind. Now can you understand why they're tired? They marched 90 miles north with the Philistines ostensibly to fight against Israel with them. Then they're rejected, they, they march 90 miles back and now they found out that their family's been attacked, now they've got to go march on another battle. Uh, you ever do the math on that? That's a lot of, you know, they're marching you know, like 200 miles in just a few days and they are, I mean, even though they're trying to save their families, they physically cannot go on. Some of you remember the story when Gideon and his 300 soldiers were attacking this vast army of a million it says they were pursuing exhausted. They were exhausted but still pursuing. And what gives you the strength to go on when you're exhausted? Well, how could David, some of the men stayed behind but David and his men they went on. How could you keep going on when you're physically at the end like that? And then once you get caught up with them what do you got to do? You got to fight. I mean you just get in there you think I can rest. No, now you got to fight a war their love for the lost family mobilizes them. You know, when you love somebody and you know you've got to go the second mile to get them, it's no problem. And so David's thinking about his wives and his, he has children actually at this point, though they were very young, and, um, and all of his men, they've got wives and children and they are going to go until they drop to try to save them. But God gave him a promise. He said, you'll recover all. So while they're pursuing, they find out there among all the footprints from the Amalekite camels in the dust, there's a slave that is laying on the ground half dead. They found an Egyptian in the field and they brought him to David. They had to carry him to David. And they gave him bread and he ate and they gave him water. I'd have the water first. And they gave him a piece of a cake of figs and two clusters of raisins. He was hungry. So when he had eaten, his strength came back to him, for he had not eaten bread or drunk water for three days and three nights. There you got it again, three days and three nights. Does that sound familiar? And he revived. Do you have another story in the Bible of someone reviving after three days and three nights? And David said to him, To whom do you belong? Or where are you from? He said, I'm a young man from Egypt, a servant of an Amalekite. My master let me go. The Amalekites weren't very good to their slaves. He just dumped them. He left me behind because I was sick. We made an invasion in the southern area of the Cherethites in the territory that belongs to Judah, the southern area of Caleb, and we burned Ziklag with fire. And David said, can you take me down to this troop? Do you know where they went? He said, swear to me by God you'll neither kill me nor deliver me back to the hands of my master and I'll take you down to this troop. After all, they dumped me. 
And he brought him down there. There they were spread out over all the land, eating and drinking and dancing because of the great spoil that they had taken from the land of the Philistines and from Judah. And David sees them. They probably watched on the hill and rested a little bit. They let them get good and drunk. And he knew his family was down there. But they stood up there and it says, And David attacked them from twilight until the evening of the next day for a whole day. That must have been a big army because it said not a man of them escaped except 400. When you say not a man, only 400. <laughs> Whenever you say only 400 escaped, well how many were there? Must have been thousands. But David and his 400 exhausted men, they, they came on them and they were all drunk and hung over and they, they, they had a food coma, they had eaten so much, they had been feasting and you know when the judgment came on the Amalekites was at the end of a party. You know that often happens in the Bible. It's you know, it's when the party's over the judgment comes. And they attacked them. 400 young men escaped on camels. And David, just as the prophet had said, the priest said, he recovered all the Amalekites had carried away and David rescued his two wives and nothing of theirs was lacking either small or great sons or daughters spoil or anything which they had taken except now they've got even more because they not only got what they took from Ziklag they've got what they took from everywhere else plus what they had and David just keeps growing in spurts you notice he blessed him with um, uh, naval stuff and now he's been blessed again and you'll find out he ends up paying a tithe of everything he gets here to the elders of Israel. So he recovers everything. Now who does David represent in our study we've been doing? Jesus is called the son of David. Is Jesus going to come? Will there be a great judgment? Will it come at an hour when the world least expects it? Is he going to recover all that trust in him? And even though we're we've been taken captive by the enemy. If we're his children, he is coming to rescue us. Jesus is pictured in Revelation coming on a horse with a sword, isn't he? David comes down when the enemy took his family, he comes down with a sword and a horse. You know there's another story in the Bible. How many of you remember when word comes to Abraham that Sodom has been captured in Gomorrah and the other cities, but that meant Lot and his family were all captured. Abraham and some friends arm themselves and they go attack five kings up in the north. His name was Chedorlaomer. Took me years to learn how to say Chedorlaomer. They went to attack them and Abraham recovers all, doesn't he? And when you're fighting for the Lord, for the salvation of others, and not only does Abraham recover all, he ends up with a great bounty and he pays tithe on it. This is exactly what David does. He gets all this tithe and he sends it on, as you'll see in the next chapter, to the elders of Israel. Now David comes back and he meets up with the other soldiers and they go through a little argument. They decide to share all the spoil because they've got even more now than they had before. And um, you get to chapter 31, last chapter in 1 Samuel. Now we're going to flash forward to the battle in the north. What's happening up north where David and his men had been just rejected. Now the Philistines fought against Israel and the men of Israel fled from before the Philistines and fell slain on Mount Gilboa. And the Philistines followed hard after Saul and his sons. And the Philistines killed, it always makes me sad to even read it, the Philistines killed Jonathan, Abinadab, and Malchishua, Saul's sons. And the battle, and the boys were doing the best to save their father, and so they were slain first. And the battle became fierce against Saul. And the archers hit him. And he was severely wounded, more than one arrow, by the archers. And he's surrounded by his crack troops and they're trying to fight back the Philistines as well. Because Saul knows he's mortally wounded. He's bleeding profusely. And what he's afraid of is that the Philistines are going to break through and they're going to get him. And they're going to just torture him and taunt him and he says to his armor bearer, draw your sword and thrust me through with it, lest these uncircumcised men come and thrust me through and abuse me. He said, don't let them have the credit. I fought them all my life. I don't want them to kill me. 
but his armor bearer would not, for he was greatly afraid. You know what the principal job of the armor bearer is? At all costs, save the life of the king, not kill the king. He said, I can't do that. And he would not. Therefore Saul took a sword, and they were sharp, and he fell on it. You've heard that expression probably used a hundred times. Don't fall on your own sword. It's all drawn from this story in the Bible. Saul, he didn't have anyone else to do it, so he put the sword on the ground, and he fell right into it and mortally wounded himself. And his armor bearer, when he saw what happened, and he saw that they were surrounded, he fell on his sword, and he died with him. So Saul and his three sons and his armor bearer, it's interesting, it mentions not just his sons, but it mentions twice the armor bearer. You know, I think it's interesting because David was once his armor bearer. And I have a feeling if David was there, that wouldn't have happened. And all his men died together that same day. Now it doesn't mean the whole army died, because Abner and others survived, but a lot of soldiers fell on the field. And the men of Israel who were on the other side of the valley and those who were on the other side of Jordan saw that the men of Israel had fled and that Saul and his sons were dead. They forsook the cities and fled. They, they had to flee. They lost a great territory to the Philistines. And the Philistines came and dwelt in them. It's interesting. David has now annexed a city of the Philistines and the Philistines are annexing the cities of Israel. So it happened the next day when the Philistines came to strip the slain that they found Saul and his three sons fallen on Mount Gilboa. And they cut off his head, what David had done to Goliath. And they stripped off his armor, what David had done to Goliath. And they sent word throughout the land of the Philistines to proclaim it in the temple of their idols. They are rejoicing, they are glorifying these pagan gods among the people. And they put his armor in the temple of the Ashereths and they fastened his body to the walls of Bethshin. It's interesting that the um, Bethshin means a place of peace, a house of peace. Now Bethshin is in the territory of Israel. They took this city right on the crossroads. Bethshin, you can see a picture of it today. I think I even have a picture of it you can put up on the screen. Yeah, there it is. Up on top of that hill was this city. It's on the crossroads in the middle of Israel, not far from Jezreel. They had a big wall there. It was a great billboard to advertise. And there they pinned the bodies, the headless body of Saul and the bodies of his three sons. Now one of those sons, what was his name? Jonathan. You know, this is the Jonathan who was to be prince, who told David, here is my robe, here is my belt, here is my sword, here is my bow and he made a covenant with David, and he loved David, and he said, you will reign in my place. And you know, I can't help but miss the, the analogy here, that here you've got that son, Jonathan means Yah Nathan, gift of Jehovah. God so loved the world, he gave his son as a gift. That he is pinned up on the wall, suspended between heaven and earth, and the men of Jabesh Gilead, when they saw that, they were loyal, they came, risking their lives. They took the bodies of Saul and his sons down, and they basically had a cremation and a burial for them. Jesus had friends that came and rescued his body. And so, just at the very end, you even see, at the end of this book, you can see another picture of the cross, Jonathan, who I think is a type of Christ, who loved David, who traded places with David, who gave him a sword, a belt, a shield, makes us think of Jesus who said, look, I will die suspended between heaven and earth for you. I am the son of the king, but I will let you have my throne, and I'll give you my sword, his word, and I'll give you my bow, his strength. I'll give you my robe, his righteousness. This is what Jesus did for us. And this is how 1 Samuel ends. And... Um, an interesting transition happens now when we get into the second book of Samuel and the story of David. But I thought it was a good place for us to think about the life of Jesus. And all of these stories are here to talk to us about Christ. Amen?